conversation about hemorrhage control is uh, timely um, relative to the M&Ms we discussed. Now, if we're going to take on uh, big, big challenges and big cases, I think it's really important to think about what are all of the tools at our disposal to think about how to do these things in a multidisciplinary and creative way. And we were just talking about some of the things that I think we can do to, to help improve how we think about this. But as surgeons, this is what we do. This is this is our line of work. This is the main thing that I would say differentiates us um, that we deal with that most of our colleagues in other uh, fields, even other surgical fields, don't deal with quite as often. So I look forward to uh, Dr. Kokonar to talk about some of the history of uh, how we think about hemorrhage control. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I decided to do, this was actually for a lecture in Cleveland um, where I used to, tr where I trained at. And I wanted to do something a little fun, and but something that also was related to trauma. And as I went through this, it really is kind of interesting to know where we've been. I have no disclosures. The control of hemorrhage following injury, as we all know and as we heard earlier this morning, is absolutely paramount to survival. If you can't control hemorrhage, the patient's going to die. Uh, but in ancient times, the concept of hemorrhage was very difficult to grasp. Um, they didn't know about circulation. They didn't know about ligation. They didn't know about all these things that we kind of take for granted today. And minor bleeding was taken care of by bandaging. Uh, and the most effective means that they had in, and we're talking in the, beast, in the before Christ area, um, cautery and possibly as early as 3000 BC. It was something that was usually used not for bleeding necessarily, but oftentimes to open abscesses, etc. And by the time the tourniquet was recognized, and I put it again, guns had come on the scene. And this is from The Healing Hand, which is a wonderful book if you've not read it. Death by hemorrhage was given an extended chance to work for natural selection. Mesopotamia, the Akkadian was the first Mesopotamian culture and is back in that uh, 2350 to 2170 BC era, Bronze Age, um, what would be considered Assyria and Babylonia. Their idea of first aid was both primitive first aid as well as sorcery. And Hammurabi's code, as I'm sure you've heard in the past, surgery is mentioned only in terms of assault and battery as far as what the um, for doing a surgery and that it didn't work then the surgeon would actually pay with sometimes his hand or uh, something else. In Egypt the Smith papyrus is well known from around 1600 BC it was believed to be from an earlier based on an earlier text from the Old Kingdom and was attributed to Imhotep who was an architect, high priest and physician in the 3000 to 2500 BC era. And it was essentially a textbook for trauma of 48 cases. But interestingly, not one case of hemorrhage was mentioned in all of those 48 cases. And also an interesting tidbit was that they recommended using raw meat for the first day of a wound. Um, in China, uh, there was a very important medical textbook but surgery was considered very low status. And for bleeding, again, it was just advocated uh, tight bandaging. In ancient India, of which Ayurveda, knowledge of life, uh, there were two main textbooks, one in medicine, one in surgery, the Sushruta Samhita. And most of what they dealt with were arrow wounds. So there were detailed uh, texts on how to decide if it was an arrow that needed to be pushed through or pulled back. Um, they also had what they called marmas. And these were essentially pressure points or points on the body that you knew um, different things would happen. And actually, the physician, the vaidya, would not take on wounds in points that were known to be mortal. So they just knew, you know, I can't do anything about that, so go on. And they did know some possible treatments, compression, elevation, cold, as well as hot oil and heat. And they knew about tourniquet, but they used it for snake bite, not for hemorrhage. In Greece, there were 147 wounds mentioned in the Iliad. Mortality rate was 77.6%. But when you realize what they did for wounds, treatment of a wound, they told the patient take a seat, they did lots of storytelling, gave him a cup of pramnium wine sprinkled with grated cheese and barley meal. 
And Odysseus, or Ulysses, was gored by a, a boar. His uncle staunched the blood with an epiodic, a charm. So basically a story. Obviously, if you're really bleeding, you're not going to have much help with that. We think of Hippocrates, and that is really a school. The Corpus Hippocraticum was as, uh, associated with his school of medicine. And their standard care goes back to you bleed to get rid of the bad humors, you starve to prevent new ones from forming, and purge to get rid of the rest. And this is a case study that was taken from uh, by uh, Manuel from the Healing Hand of a case from Hippocrates Corpus Hippocraticum. And the carpenter's axe had slipped and cut his foot deeply, pale, bleeding heavily. Treatment was positioning the part, the leg is raised, so they knew about that. Cold water was applied to around the spot from where the blood flows. A warm towel was wrapped around his head to try and divert more blood up to the head and away from the wound. Sap from a fig tree was put on a plug of wool into the wound. They thought that because if you put sap from a fig tree into milk, it would coagulate, so therefore they extrapolated it to blood and hoped that it would coagulate the blood. It doesn't, though. Bandage was soaked in red wine, wrapped around the wound. And they also knew about putting a ligature around the leg. Ligatures will increase the flow of blood if strong. They will stop it. But they also knew that causes of gangrene of tissues are constriction in wounds with hemorrhage, compression and fractures of bones, and mortification from bandages. So they felt that another band placed above the knee and a vein in the ankle is slit. So essentially, hemorrhage will kill, but bleeding might help that. Not, not a lot of sense in that at that point. Rufus of Ephesus in first century AD did describe all the methods for hemorrhage control that was known to the ancient world, which included digital compression, styptics, cautery, a torsion or tourniquet, as well as ligature. Galen, who was essentially a Greek physician in Rome, uh, was from the second century AD and advised digital pressure on bleeding the vessel if it were superficial but if deep, it was important to know whether it was a vein or an artery. And if it was a vein, you could use just pressure or a styptic to control the bleeding. But if it was artery, it needed to be ligated with linen. Celsus was provided, has provided most of the knowledge of hemostasis that we knew from the first and century, second centuries AD. And they, he described ligating and dividing blood vessels. So the blood vessels that are pouring out blood are to be grasped and about the wounded spot, they are to be tied in two places and cut across in between so that each may retract and yet have its opening closed. So they, at this point, ligation was known. So keep this in mind. This is um, first and second century AD. These are the methods of control that I'm going to touch on today. The direct pressure, compression, styptics, cauterization, tourniquets, ligation, and vascular techniques. Direct pressure and compression was something that was known. Ancient India recognized direct pressure upon the wound. Rufus of Ephesus advocated direct compression in the first century AD. Galen in the second century AD with direct digital pressure on a bleeding vessel, if superficial. From 1732, the naval surgeon, uh, the stump must needs be as secure from a flux as if a strong compression were made with the thumb immediately on the vessel itself. And today, it's still the first response to active bleeding. So on the left is a section taken from the wilderness um, and remote first aid from the Red Cross. And what's inside that blue circle is cover the wound with a sterile dressing and apply direct pressure to the bleeding wound. Then we also use it with other injuries, such as liver injuries. 1913, liver packing was introduced by Halstead. But it was condemned during World War II due to rebleeding and sepsis, especially if you leave the packs in for a long time. But it was reintroduced in the late 1970s and 80s and is still a very viable technique that we use very frequently when we have to operate on an injured liver. Extraperitoneal pelvic packing was introduced in Europe in the mid-1990s and reintroduced again in 2007, both in Europe and coming out of Denver. There's also hemostatic agents and styptics. A hemostatic agent promotes hemostasis, whereas a styptic will cause tissue contraction and vasoconstriction. Fresh meat, as I already mentioned, 
was from Egyptian thought, the proteins actually may help coagulation when you put it on a fresh wound. Sap from a fig tree, it will cause milk to coagulate, and so they thought, well, okay, if it causes milk to clot up, then perhaps it will do the same with blood, which it doesn't. And ancient Peruvians in South America used masticated herbs for fresh wounds to try and get uh, bleeding to stop. Other styptics in the 17th and 18th century, I just, the list is rather interesting, some of which is difficult to try and put together today, but all of these were essentially all things dry and have an asperity of taste, was considered something that could be used as a styptic. Um, additional agents, and one of which you'll see over and over when you go through this, is oil from the resin of longleaf pines, turpentine. Um, was used quite frequently in the management of wounds. Pere included aloes in his mixture, and um, from the surgeon's mate, which is um, from 1617, a combination of styptics and caustics coupled with buttons of tow, which was basically soft lint. In the Civil War, they made use of a number of things, some of which you still see today. So the things like green persimmon, but alum, alum tannic acid, uh, persulfate of iron and perchloride of iron and silver nitrate, which is actually not so much a styptic but a caustic. So we actually still use these today. You can buy them on Amazon, anhydrous aluminum sulfate, potassium alum, or titanium dioxide. Uh, hemostatic agents, a couple of different mechanisms, can either be physical adherence to damaged tissues and sealing injured vessels, or accelerating and strengthening the clotting of blood. It's achieved either through rapid absorption of water from the blood, concentrating the clotting elements, or a chemical reaction that activates the clotting cascade in platelets and requires an intact coagulation cascade and serves as a scaffold for thrombus. This is just a list of characteristics that the US military would like to see in a hemostatic agent that can be applied. It includes things like approved or cleared by the FDA, stopping arterial and or venous bleeding in two minutes or less, no toxicity or side effect, causes no pain or thermal injury, poses no risk to the medics that are applying it, ready to use requires little or no training, durable, lightweight, flexible enough to fit complex wounds, easily removed without leaving residues, stable and functional at extreme temperatures for at least two weeks, practical and easy to use under austere conditions, whether it's low visibility, rain, or wind, effective on junctional wounds not amenable to a tourniquet, and a long shelf life, inexpensive, biodegradable, bioabsorbable. A big list of things that you would need. There have been a, a number of things that have been out there initially. Quick Lot, which was originally zeolite, which was mineral-based, caused rapid absorption of water, but it had a very exothermic reaction, would actually cause burns. It's no longer being sold, the zeolite. Um, Smectite, a wound stat, mineral-based, again, rapid absorption of water, activates intrinsic cascade, binds tightly to the underlying tissues, and completely, it needs to be completely removed before you can do any kind of repair to the vessels. And because it would stick and um, it was granular type of form, it was difficult to get out. What was interesting, and some of the work was done by Dr. Gerlach, it caused um, embolization, there was inflammation that actually led it to being uh, no longer being used by the military. Some other things, Kytosan was FDA approved in 2002. Um, it's a partially deacetylated form of chitin found in shellfish. It has strong adherence to wet tissues and sealing off of the vessels, but when they looked at it, there was not a lot of difference between it and just plain gauze. And unfortunately, the adherence decreases with time. And so it basically really can't stop the bleeding for more than about an hour. Celox or chitosan is a granular form, but inconsistent hemostasis, bioabsorbable, but it elicits a very strong inflammatory reaction and comes as a powder so that if you try to use it in the field when there's wind, it just blows everywhere, not, west, not necessarily where you want to use it. Kaolin is an inert mineral that activates factor 12. And now this is what's incorporated into quick clot combat gauze. And it's been approved for 
hemostatic dressing for all the U.S. military. We actually have some in our armamentarium in the operating room area in uh, ED. It's the most effective dressing in arterial hemorrhage model. Um, its application is relatively easy, and better yet, it can be removed easily to be able to do whatever repair is necessary. Then there are others that are probably more familiar to you um, when you are working in the operating room. Uh, Surgicel, which is an oxidized, regenerated cellulose, it's dry, absorbable mesh, fully absorbed in about 14 days, has bactericidal activity due to low pH, but if you have a low pH, it may actually inhibit its resorption, and then it can cause more problems. So it's not totally uh, bioabsorbable, depending on its milieu. The gelatin matrix, or gel foam, it's a hydrocolloid made from acid partial hydrolysis of porcine-derived collagen. It's then whipped to an, into a foam and then dried, absorbed four to six weeks. It's usually moistened with topical thrombin in the way that we use it. Others are like a microporous polysaccharide spheres, which is a potato starch. Uh, it absorbs water, concentrates the factors. It's low cost, rapid absorption, and doesn't appear to cause a foreign body reaction. Avatine, or microfibular collagen, is absorbable acid salt from bovine collagen and acts both as a scaffold and, acts and activates platelets. Moving on to tourniquets. Tight bandages have been applied since antiquity for taking care of bleeding. Amputations originally were performed not above where you would have necrotic tissue, but at the line of demarcation within the area of necrotic tissue because they had no way, they didn't know ligation, so they had no way of being able to handle the blood vessel. And so um, they had to go through what was already dead. And they found that ligatures um, this is from the Corpus Hippocraticum, ligatures will increase the flow of blood, but if strong, they'll stop it. So it was something that they already knew that if you only put it on partially, it would increase venous bleeding. Galen criticized tourniquets because he felt that they forced more blood from the wound, so they weren't being really used as a uh, true tourniquet. Um, but what's interesting is, remember, this is back in the first or second century AD, they knew about tourniquets. That was all lost, because it wasn't until Guy de Chauliac, in 13, who lived between 1300 and 1368, described constricting bands for control of hemorrhage during an amputation, one above and one below. In the 16th century, when uh, Leonardo Botalo described a triple band tourniquet system, uh, 1517, Hans von Gerstorff de described a similar technique in a field manual of wound medicine, the Feldbuch der Wundherzene. In 1593, William Fabry described what we would consider a windlass type of tourniquet, basically a stick and a bandage twisting until the arterial flow stops. Um, and it was in 1674 that Morel actually employed a rudimentary type of tourniquet described by Fabry at the siege of Besançon. Scultitis had a screw compressor, but it was Louis Petit who actually coined the term tourniquet. And that, you see under the left side, is actually a uh, picture of his device. And Van Esmark described the rubber bandage that we use today for exsanguination and tourniquet use. And that was, um, he lived in the late 1800s. Civil War, the tourniquet was used by both sides. Soldiers actually carried a roller, a bandana, with stick to use as a windlass. Interestingly, one of the Confederate generals who had nerve damage from a previous duel in 1837 was shot in the leg, died from exsanguination because he couldn't feel the blood dripping down into his boot, and ended up dying despite the fact that he had a tourniquet in his pocket. World War I, and I want you to notice that prolonged evacuation time, because this is when tourniquets really fell into a lot of um, condemnation. The tourniquets were left on for very long periods of time because they just couldn't get the soldiers out of theater very quickly. Tuffier, who was a consulting surgeon to the French armies in the field, felt that the tourniquet is sometimes utilized under circumstances where it is actually impossible to apply a ligature, but it has caused disasters. 
in the official British manual from 1918, the systematic use of the elastic tourniquet cannot be too severely condemned. The employment of it, except as a temporary measure during an operation, usually indicates that the person employing it is quite ignorant both of how to stop bleeding properly and also the danger to life and limb caused by the tourniquet. Spanish Civil War, 1937-39, more lives, more limbs and lives were lost at the front from improper use of the tourniquet than are saved by its proper use. This, in World War II, the Seventh Army Surgeon directed the sole indication was active spurting hemorrhage from a major artery. But again, keep in mind, all of these had long, prolonged evacuation times for patients off the field. Korean War, you started to see a positive view of tourniquets return. But, and they uh, felt that saved lives and limbs were not lost due to misuse. But keep in mind, that's when you started to see evacuation times decrease. Vietnam War, tourniquets were improvised, lives were saved, limbs were not lost to misuse, at least it was not considered that. And as we've seen in Iraq and Afghanistan, especially with the difference in how um, fighting has changed, tourniquets are encouraged, they're considered a true advance, survival benefit has been confirmed, and every, surgeon, every soldier has a tourniquet and they know how to use it. But the big thing is that evacuation times have continued to improve. They're able to get to uh, care in a timely fashion, be able to have bleeding actually be cared for. In civilian use, again, it was previously condemned. Um, ATLS, in its ninth edition, actually included the judicious use of a tourniquet may be helpful and life-saving. So the sentiment has actually started changing, and it became especially so after the Boston bombing because of mass casualty type events. And so now people are, are starting to train their EMS, and they have to be trained in how it's used. I've already seen at least one person come in where the tourniquet was actually below the injury. Um, it doesn't really help you much on that. And, but in this day and age, no patient should exsanguinate from an extremity wound. You want to use direct pressure first, elevation and packing, but then a tourniquet if you still need to be able to have additional help in controlling the bleeding. And they can sometimes expedite in getting the patient transferred, especially if it's from, uh, depending on where your surroundings are. Um, it also allows temporary control in a mass casualty event, but you have to fully expose the limb that has a tourniquet, because if it's covered over with a blanket or sheet, that tourniquet may not be seen. You also need to, rec if you're gonna use them, you have to record the time that the tourniquet was placed. There's actually a national movement um, called Stop the Bleed, where they hope to be able to put tourniquets next to the uh, defibrillators in the public places um, to with pictures that show what to do, compress first, then tourniquet, compress again as needed. Cautery. Cauterization was known to the earliest civilizations, but they didn't necessarily use it for bleeding. The Ebers papyrus heated knives for cutting open cysts and abscesses. Hippocrates and Celsus all used cautery, but again, not necessarily for bleeding. It was um, Arabic practitioners in the 10th and 11th centuries that used cautery and for the treatment of bleeding wounds, and they included both hot oil and tar. Caustics or potential cauteries include things like a vitriol button, which was copper sulfate uh, sprinkled on cotton, or a pledget pressed out of spirit of turpentine. There's that turpentine again. And they were known to gnaw and corrode on the ends of nerves and tendons, and they created quite a bit of pain. Other agents, uh, egypticum, which was primary ingredient with sulfuric acid, nitric acid, arsenic, caustic stones made of potash, wood ashes, lime, salts of glass, potassium sulfate, lye, mercury chloride, and in the 21st century, we still use caustics, silver nitrate. Middle Ages used almost exclusively cautery for bleeding. They heated metal probes, and there were different sizes and shapes, as you can see. You had a different shape for different applications. Firearms were invented in the 13th century China. And because of that, this was something brand new. Nobody knew what to think of a um, gunshot wound. And they were considered poisoned. And so Heinrich von uh, Fulsprut, in his 
Book der Bund Erznein in 1460 um, elicited the reaction of what the rationale behind cauterizing war wounds because they all felt that they were poison and this was a way of being able to get rid of the poison. But it was Ambroise Pere who was a French barber surgeon and in his very first battle he ran out of boiling oil that and he used an old Roman technique of oil of roses, egg white and turpentine and his famous quote uh, you can see it there in French I bandaged him and God healed him he was quite surprised that they did much better without cautery if you go on to Galvan, uh, the use of electrical current it was first introduced in 1854 by Albrecht Theodor Middeldorf thin platinum wires heated by a galvanic current and then in 1926 the familiar Bovi which was a high frequency current delivered by a cutting loop Monopolar was concentrated at a tip of the active electrode and then exiting the current dispersed over a broad surface area through the Bovi pad that we know it today. Bipolar wasn't actually introduced until 1973 and was delivered by one prong and retrieved by the other prong. Uh, electrothermal bipolar tissue sealing system as we know it as ligature and then ultrasonic vibrations to cut and cauterize at 55,000 hertz a harmonic scalpel. Ligation is another technique that was introduced first century. Uh, it's thought by Archigenes who advocated amputating above the necrosis but ligating the artery. That gave them the ability to do that. Galen advocated ligation with linen if arterial injury. But ligation was actually forgotten for 1200 years. It wasn't until 10th century AD that a Moorish Spain physician advocated ligation in a book, Kitab al Tazrif. Jerome of Brunswick, um, who was an Alsatian army surgeon, described the use of ligatures for stopping hemorrhage in 1497. Pere, of course, knew the technique, and when he found that he had more wounds than he had boiling oil, um, started using more ligation. And because he wrote a book and it was well accepted throughout, he spread his techniques and ideas across Europe, which is one of the reasons why it became more in the uh, fore. But obviously there's complications of ligation. Infection, secondary hemorrhage. It was well known that if you ligated something, then you would expect the secondary hemorrhage um, week to two weeks afterwards when that uh, would cause sepsis and the ligature would fall off. The sutures were actually left long to allow separation, necrosis, and granulation, and then they were actually pulled away. It wasn't until an assistant surgeon at the Royal Naval Hospital in Halsler, Hare, began cutting sutures short that it became acceptable that you didn't have to go back in and pull the ligature off. Repair was first done in 1759 of brachiotary using a farrier stitch by Hallowell and Lambert, and Broca also reported repair in 1762. But repair of vessels, and I'm not going to get into that, that's a whole other uh, lecture, uh, required waiting until there was asepsis and anesthesia. This would now go on to endovascular embolization, which really came into being with uh, Sven Ivar Seldinger in 1953 when he, when he described the Sel what we know as the Seldinger technique. It decreased major complications with um, the use of arteriography. And essentially, arteriography became relatively risk-free. So that not only increased the use of arteriography for diagnosis, it also increased it for um, the advent of treatment. And it was 1972 that Rosh and Dotter described embolization for GI bleeding. In that same year, Margulies described embolization of hemorrhage from a pelvic fracture. And in 1977, uh, Rubin and Katzen reported selective hepatic artery embolization following trauma. Sclafani reported embolization of the spleen in 1981 for trauma. The CT, along with the same time, the CT began replacing DPL as a screening tool for trauma. Um, and with that, you started to be able to see blush, and as our CT scans have gotten better, you now can see this. And this just shows a series of a splenic angiogram showing active bleeding in the inferior pole. Splenic, selected splenic angiogram confirms the active bleeding, 
And then the angiogram shows no active bleeding after embolization with coils. And now we have both management of pelvic fracture with hemodynamic instability as well as blunt hepatic trauma. These are Western trauma surgery algorithms. You have angiography and embolization included in these, as well as from EAST guidelines for management of splenic injury, including angiography should be considered for patients with a grade 3 injury or greater. There's also other endovascular options in trauma. Uh, you start seeing operative repair endovascular stent graft in blunt thoracic trauma, so basically ruptured aortas. And there was a transition from angiogram to CTA. You had then the advent of TVARs, improved outcomes with transition to a TVAR type repair. Mortality decreased from 22% to 13%. Paraplegia decreased from 8.7 to 1.6%. And you were more likely to be able to do delayed repair rather than having to do immediate repair. And this is taken from uh, UT Houston. I got these slides from Dr. DeBose. You can see in this area, era, it was still mainly clamp and sew. And uh, distal aortic perfusion started coming in when Dr. Safi came into Houston or into Herman. And you started to see about the same, but a little bit better mortality rate. And then delayed repair, where you had the stabilization of the patient um, again. But it wasn't until TVAR was added in 2005 that you really started to see a decrease in the mortality. And so the mortality reduction of about 2% per year. And this just shows the difference, um, increasing TVAR, which is shown in pink, with medical management also becoming, because as our CT scans got better, we were started seeing things that perhaps didn't need to actually have active repair. But open repair was much, much less. And as you can see, the survival really is not different. And the red line stops because that's as far as what there is from the standpoint of actually following uh, these patients. What about endovascular use for other locations? And this just shows a uh, right pre-stent graft with active hemorrhage and then a right post-stent graft where the hemorrhage is actually controlled. So something that rather than having to go in and either ligate or try and repair, um, it's a repair from inside. Another one that shows the nice uh, improvement and so this was a NTDB study where they looked at the trends and outcomes of endovascular therapy and the management of civilian vascular injuries. It was over nine years, almost 44,000 vascular injuries. And there was a significant increase in the use of endovascular techniques from 0.3% in 2002 to about 9% in 2010. Notable increase among blunt injuries uh, was also noted. And basically, with propensity score matched populations, there was a lower in-hospital mortality following endovascular intervention and lower complication rate trends as well. But we also started seeing with the use of endovascular techniques, and this is actually something that was first presented back in 1954 by C.W. Hughes. He, ad he advocated use of an intra-aortic balloon catheter tamponade for controlling intra-abdominal hemorrhage in man following injury. There were some additional studies. There was a preliminary report on the use of a precluder occluding aortic balloon in human beings. Uh, this is basically from 1986, 1989. Um, there was a couple of these where they started attempting to try and gain control by occluding the aorta without having to go in and doing either an emergent um, chest thoracotomy. And because you started seeing translation of um, specialty skills, the ruptured aorta was a perfect translational start because this is 10 years of emergency endovascular aneurysm repair. And if you look, the 30-day mortality was 13%. This is for ruptured aortas. And one of the things that they found was selective transfemoral supraceliac aortic balloon occlusion was something that they could use to help control the bleeding while they could get control of it in a conventional way. Translational research you had endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta superior to resuscitative thoracotomy in a porcine model. Um, in a couple of these that were 
And then we have Reboa, endovascular occlusion for damage control. It's now become much more mainstream. We actually have the first series was reported in September 2013 and came from mainly uh, shock trauma in Maryland as well as UT Houston. Six patients, four blunt, two penetrating, mean systolic blood pressure 59, mean increase in systolic blood pressure 55, mean occlusion time 18 minutes. Had no complications, no hemorrhage related mortality. They've now created a database through the AAST. It's the prospective aortic occlusion for resuscitation and trauma in acute care surgery, and of course it has a cute name of aorta registry. And this looked at the first data coming out of the aorta registry from November 2013 to February 2015. Eight level one trauma centers, 114 patients. Overall, overall mortality, BOA was 71.7%, open head 83.8%. Adjusted mortality um, with a odds ratio of 0.263. And neurologic outcomes of discharge were no difference so they felt in conclusions, good outcomes can be achieved after aortic occlusion with a 21% overall survival and 9.5% ED um, uh, aortic occlusion and actually relatively good neurologic outcomes. And they felt that Reboa may actually represent a viable alternative to an open method of aortic occlusion. Again, this study or this registry is continuing and additional uh, things. But Rabo is actually being used at the bedside in certain countries. This is from the UK, where an air ambulance crew became the first team in the world to use a balloon device to control catastrophic bleeding at the roadside. And in 2016, uh, we have the ER Reboa catheter that we now have available. It is FDA approved, seven French, so it's much smaller than previously. It has both arterial pressure monitoring, prophylactic, no guide wire, which is key, makes it much easier to place. And no fluoroscopy is needed as well. And so we are having ongoing uh, looks at the current catheters. There's additional things that, as Dr. Uh, DeBose mentioned in his earlier talk this year uh, with Dr. Russo helping on some of these things. So, um, but I'd also just like to send a word of thanks to Dr. DeBose for allowing me to use some of his slides in this presentation. And at that, we have many places to go but with the hemorrhage, but we've come a long way, as you can see. I'll be happy to take any questions. Chris, I'll uh, start out by and ask one question first. Thank you for that, you know, really comprehensive review of where we've started. I'm glad we're not still putting hot oil on the moon. Um, so I, your final slide said that is a viable alternative, but what I didn't hear you say was that it's better. It's because we don't know yet. I think it probably is because I think you are seeing a lesser mortality with it. It's just in that first series that presented out of um, Marilyn and Herman, it was six patients. So it's hard to make recommendations, but you're starting to see it, and that's the reason for the registry. And we also, you know, what have been considered contraindications, you know, we've even had people here where the contraindications were softened a little bit with good results. So again, I think part of it is, is that we're still trying to figure out how to best use it. Um, but I think when you realize the morbidity that an open chest requires, especially if they don't really have chest injury, and you're able to say to people that you know you can't necessarily get up and get aortic control without having you know, having to have somebody stick their hand in or a, a pressure um, or put pressure on your supraceliac aorta uh, while you're trying to take care of whatever's bleeding down below. The, this gives you a, a very nice way of getting to it. And I think vascular is who really started that with trying to get control of their aneurysms and then they developed their T-bar that, you know, the mortality from a, uh, not T-bar, but for the E-bars have just been much, much better. So I think we're still learning, but I think it's much 
I know if it were me, do I want a open floor economy or do I want a Reboa? I'll take the Reboa. So, uh, comments from Vascular. Well, I think yes. part, well, part of the reason it's hard to show mortality improvements, the same reason that there was difficult in early days of using endovascular therapy for blunt respiratory injuries is these patients have multiple injuries. <laughs> so patients who require control of the box in order to have more than a major blood vessel injury, they have multiple long bone injuries, they have multiple fractures, they have multiple uh, huge physiologic insults, and they die typically, they frequently, even if you control arterial bleeding, they'll die from something else. And so mortality is huge, I think. Uh, Christine showed a 70% or 80% mortality in that registry series. These are very, very mortal injuries, so to show an improvement by controlling bleeding is hard. But uh, uh, I think there is something to it. Uh, certainly, the putting a uh, through economy and putting a clamp on instills a, a more difficult approach, more trauma, and usually a longer ischemic time. I think it's ischemic time that's more important. So if you can keep that ischemic time shorter, that's going to improve survival. Given the great talk, given the advancements that people are talking about, about endovascular treatments and especially in the trauma setting. Just wondering, is, is there a move towards resuscitating trauma patients in a hybrid situation where you do have access? One of the issues is when you go into a regular OR, put a wheel and a, you know, a non-fixed imaging, so why not routinely you know, plan a state-of-the-art trauma OR that has imaging? You're, a lot of places are moving more and more towards that. We do have something, uh, we do have the hybrid room. Trying to get access to the hybrid room is not always the easiest thing. Um, but we also have fluoroscopy, so we kind of can move things in and around. It's just not as easy as what you can do with a hybrid room. But that's becoming, you know, I've done at least one or two cases now for trauma in the hybrid room um, with good success. You know, one was a gunshot wound to the aorta that we couldn't get to right, you know, above and below the diaphragm. Um, and was perfectly amenable to trying to get a um, endovascular repair, and that's and we were able to do that in the hybrid room. Okay, just follow that up. The point of my question is more is if we're going to be forward looking here at UC Davis, given our expertise in trauma, should we be seriously considering state of the art our trauma rooms that include a Having one hybrid suite is not adequate. <laughs> Should we be thinking of state-of-the-art trauma suites that include these things and not just hope that oh, well, we don't have hybrid suites? Why would we proactively set this up? And I, I think we would love to be, health? and I think that uh, one of the big ideas was to have a trauma hospital with trauma operating rooms that would have those kinds of capabilities. But, but it costs right. money. But we're never going to get there if, we're not, if we don't dream it, if we don't think about it, if we don't ask it. And I think that those are important things to be thinking about. And then it's not good enough to just say, oh, well, you know, cardiology controls the text for the suite. And we need to figure out how to solve problems. And that's where we need to be. Any other thoughts or comments? Am I, am I missing? Maybe I'm not just from a surgeon, but uh, so the interest in the subclavian artery right at the platform. I think it's actually a much, it's, um, so it all depends on how stable the patient is and how, um, and also whether or not you can, um, because if you have somebody who's crashing in front of you, you're going to have to go get control of it. Um, and, but we're more and more going the route of when you have active hemorrhage from an area like that, and they actually do pretty well. Oh. Yeah, we actually had a recent patient uh, uh, had an injury to the, a branch of the supply in South Dakota uh, Country's Atrium Health Institute. Uh, access, endovascular access from the brachial artery and critical lean across the injury, and we cut down on the area. So that, that, that we're, we're done this is in the two cases that Dr. Kokenar showed of uh, stent graft treatment of, in, of hemorrhage of both subclavian arteries, deep the classical exact injury you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I would posit that it's much quicker to get control with a catheter and fluoroscope than it is with a scalpel, as long as you have the capabilities for the imaging and the skill available. So you said that, and that's one thing that's been shown for the rupture of the aortic is actually the more unstable patients probably have a bigger advantage 
that was a concern early on. So the really unstable patients you operate on is probably the patients have the biggest benefit from an endovascular technique, or the patients are more stable. And I think that we're starting to see more and more people that are realizing that. And I think you have to recognize when to use endovascular or when it's possible. And I think we're actually seeing our vascular colleagues become much more interested in helping us because these are techniques that the aortic occlusion, the reboa, is something that I think needs to be in the armamentarium of every trauma surgeon. Um, as far as endovascular techniques, I think you need to have additional training. And that's something that, unless you go through a specific training program for that, I don't think it's going to be. I think we're going to be the ones helping get control, but to actually do the repair, that's when we need our vascular colleagues. One more comment. And that is, I understand that, I know you talked about Reboa, but I understand that even at UC Davis has been some great research on perfusion catheters. Uh, in order, I'm just surprised you didn't mention that. I didn't, I was limited in my time on the talk, and so it was something that, that's why I mentioned Rachel, because she's done a lot of the work when she's been in the lab, and looking at further perfusion with that. I think that's where you're going to see it go, with monitoring of blood pressure both above and below the occlusion, being able mm -hmm. to then um, allow some perfusion. We're finding that even just minimal amounts of perfusion can decrease some of the risk of um, perfusion injury. So I think that there's, this is just basically just a beginning. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks again.